Well, good evening and welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour. We just finished an interesting conversation in regards to looking for a job during COVID-19. I thought I would reach out to uh, someone who I've interviewed before, uh, Ashley Froze, who is a uh, IP patent uh, lawyer, but also chairman of the Toronto, what is it, the Toronto Fashion Advisory Council, I think. Uh, but yeah, yes. But we were going to talk tonight about what if you wanted to become an entrepreneur and is this a good time to become an entrepreneur? And Ashley, just last week, you posted a whole bunch of suggestions on entrepreneurship. Tell me, what do you think? Is it a good time to become, to think about becoming an entrepreneur? I mean, I think it's a challenging time right now for a lot of people, but I think that if you are one of the unfortunate people that is going through redundancy and, and your uh, salary position is perhaps no longer available, I think that examining the entrepreneur tract might be a more useful time than doing a Netflix binge, for example. And so sometimes uh, people need a bit of a nudge and a push to sort of go in a different direction that they thought about doing, but they had the security of a salaried position. So it may very well be that this is a viable time for those to explore what their true passions are and can they make a livelihood from that? How do you figure that out, do you think? Pardon me? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I said, how do you think you figure that out? What your true passion is? Well, I think that, I think that there's an entrepreneurial mindset and I think that you know if you have it or you don't, you have a good sneaking suspicion. If you look at the world in a way that you can identify what the gaps are in the marketplace, or you can identify needs that the marketplace is not fulfilling, and, and you view things in a different way, that's a good indication that you may have something that is very valuable to contribute. I think that you need to be cognizant that there's an employee mindset and then there's an entrepreneurial mindset. And just because you are very skilled at doing your job, does not necessarily mean that you are skilled at running a business that does your job. So you have to really look and examine what kind of lifestyle you want to want to have and realize that it is not an easy road for sure. And it's not all gravy and there's not, you know, no boss at all. You become the boss, the handy person, the accountant, the cleric, the everything, you know, the light bulb changer all in the first couple of years but it very well could be a path that some excel at for sure. And I think that now is a time, I mean, hey, there's a lot of government funding out there that hasn't been the case before. And this is one of the rare times that everyone is able to really slow down and reevaluate what they want to do and have that time to plan and, and create business plans and create iterations maybe with the help of some government funding too maybe an so no one's going to uh no one's going to complain or or look negatively on you if uh if you took some time off during COVID 19 lots of people have lost jobs or gone on furlough or been laid off or uh or taken wage cuts or had businesses that fail so i think you're right this is sort of a a good time to uh to take stock um, you know, the, the, the wage subsidies, the SERPs, the, uh, the uh, monies that the government's made of, governments have made available, um, even uh, the rent uh, subsidies that governments have made available reduce risk to a certain extent. Um, and then I think, you know, a lot of people are just spending more time thinking at home, contemplating, um, less time busy out networking and, uh, and going to events because we're not allowed to. And so, yeah, you're right. You can either watch Netflix all day long or you can think about what well, you want to do. How do you want to use this time? I mean, for myself, I'm an entrepreneur, I guess, in my own way in that I left Bay Street 10 years ago to launch my own firm. And I, even when things were a little bit slower, I mean, generally people need lawyers and good times are bad, which, you know, I, I, I'm cognizant of. But even if I, there was a time where it was a bit slower and I was doing the Netflix kind of thing, you know, I was reading a lot of biographies and autobiographies on entrepreneurs. I was learning, learning, learning. There's not, not an opportunity to waste. Of course, the weekends, you know, I'd watch maybe Real Housewives, et cetera. But the rest of the time, if I had downtime, 
I was constantly reiterating what is my business, what's the demand for the marketplace, and how can I meet them and accelerate. So it's, um, I think that when you become an entrepreneur, it is very much you become your business and it becomes very much intertwined with who you are. So why did you decide to uh, start your own law firm rather than do the, the Bay Street corporate uh, gig? Well, I've been on Bay Street for 10 years and I fast tracked a partner in six years, which is quite quick. Um, I think that I had the entrepreneurial mindset throughout my whole career, but I didn't realize that I was going to be a business owner. And then it just dawned on me after 10 years, I had my own book of business. I was in media, I was on the national news a bunch of times. I had a lot of speaking engagements, published author. Like I had my portfolio and I just kind of realized that the Bay Street model, although it's fantastic for what it is, it doesn't have to be the only way. And so I wanted to create a law firm that was Bay Street caliber without the Bay Street bullshit that goes with it, the inflated prices, the red tape, the politics that go with it. And so we're able to provide services to our clients in a much more poignant way that is business savvy as opposed to the leg, you know, legal letter of the law kind of way that sometimes forgets about the business nuances. But I also wanted to create a platform for other lawyers that want something a bit different to have a home as well. You specialize in IP law, uh, patents, technology, et cetera. Is that something you did on Bay Street or is that something you did only when you went uh, on your own? Well, to clarify, I don't do patent law. Um, so I focus on trademarks, copyright, domain names, social media, marketing and advertising, packaging and labeling corporate and contract law. That's my wheelhouse. And I've always really focused on B2C branded product services and talent. So if I have a client that is shifting pop culture because they're an influencer or a celebrity or a DJ or a model or cosmetics or cannabis or fashion or apparel or you know conferences, those are my kind of clients. And that is something that I always focused in. And the great thing about being able to launch my own firm is that we pretty much exclusively deal with clients that are shifting pop culture, that are lifestyle kind of brands. And it's really interesting to, to see, see that come into fruition for our clients. You posted on Instagram a, a jacket or something like that that said, uh, fashion is my drug. Yeah. Um, and uh, it sounds to me like you were able to combine your your ability, your education and your ability in the law and your interest in the specific area with the law was something that you were passionate about, uh, you know, separate and distinct from the law. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that this is part of my entrepreneurial journey is that there was no fashion law movement established in Canada until I sort of created it. Obviously, there are lawyers that had fashion clients pre me, but there wasn't a specialization within fashion law. And so I saw that there was a need for this industry. And I saw that I could provide a lot of value add from my legal perspective, but then also from my business acumen of knowing the industry well and able to merge them together. And just to do a shout out, because you know, I'm always into supporting Canadian designers. So that jacket is sequined. It is fantastic. And it is made by Rockin' Karma, who is a Canadian designer. And she is, her store is on Queen West near Trinity Bellwoods area. Always giving a shout out to uh, different fashion Always people. Gotta do it. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of a Japanese concept called uh, Aikigai uh, or Ikigai, um, but uh, I find it very helpful. And I think you may actually have achieved it. And what it says is that uh, too often people only focus on what they're passionate about or what they're good at. And really what you've got to do to find success in life is, is answer four questions. One is what you're good at. Second is what you're passionate about. Third is what you can get paid for. And fourth is what the world needs more of. And, right. uh, and, and the argument would be that if you're good at it um, and you were good at law, uh, you could do a whole bunch of other things that you wouldn't be very happy with. Um, and, uh, and you may not be happy in life. If you do only what you're passionate about fashion, you might not be a great designer. And so therefore uh, you may not be successful. Uh, and if you're passionate about music and you're good at music, but no one will pay you, 
to be a musician, right. then that's not the right solution. So I think that that's kind of interesting because you found something that you're passionate about, fashion and uh, creative people, entrepreneurial people that are starting new businesses, and you're really good at it, assisting them with the law. And clearly we need people in the law business that, uh, that aren't at the Bay Street uh, prices that can uh, provide legal advice to those people. I appreciate that. I think one of the things with dealing with creatives and entrepreneurs is that I found that there's a lot of different types of intelligence and there's definitely, I see a left brain and a right brain divide. And sometimes my clients are fantastic and amazing at what they do, but it can be a bit of a pinning down a cloud, but you need that complement of left brain, right brain. So what I try to do is bridge the gap between the two. And I think that it's a value add to our clients to be able to understand where they're coming from, get their language, but you got to anchor it too into, you know, itemized tasks. You got to be able to make money and uh, you got to be able to come up with all those tasks that are going to create a revenue model, a business model that's going to end up being successful. But I do think that the point that you make, which is, uh, I think the number one point is that this is a a time uh, during COVID-19 and our, particularly as we now go back into lockdown, um, uh, where people have going to have some extra time. Um, you can't go out to restaurants, you can't go out to bars, you can't go out to galas, you can't go out to events. Um, yeah, you can watch Netflix, but uh, you know maybe be creative. I posted uh, something uh, this weekend that got uh, a fair amount of attention. I'm not sure who I copied it from, but in 1606, did you know that Shakespeare's theater was forced to close because of the plague? Yes. So he wrote King Lear, Macbeth, Anthony and Cleopatra. Yeah, I knew that. I knew that one. And that was uh, something that circulated, I think, in like March or April. And it's so true. And it's interesting because I have a lot of clients, you know, over 400 or so clients. And it's been interesting to see those that are just on their game and they are pivoting and responding and anticipating and they are doing very well. And obviously, there is an economic impact, but it is not universal. And I'm seeing those clients that are not taking this sitting down, that are being very proactive, and it's paying off for them in, in big ways. So, you know, using us as a time to lick your wounds, although it might be beneficial in the time from the long term, this is not the time to, to rely on status quo or sort of bury yourself. Ashley Froze, if people want to access your, uh, your legal talents, how do they do that? Do you have a website they can go to? Certainly do. We just rejuvenated it, actually. And so that's one of the tasks we were doing. So it's Froze Law, F-R-O-E-S-E law.com. Thank you, Ashley Froze, for uh, chatting with us tonight. Uh, we're going to take, uh, we're going to, we're going to come back with you on another evening, uh, but that's the show for tonight. We've talked a little bit about getting a job during COVID-19 and now we've talked about uh, entrepreneurship during COVID-19. Uh, that's our show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio, our Saga 960. So we've spoken with uh, Ashley Froze of Froze Law uh, before. We're going to continue a concept uh, that we talked about, which is using COVID-19 in this time of, uh, of lockdown, self-isolation, uh, staying at home a little bit more than usual, and thinking about entrepreneurship. And, uh, and, and, and Ashley put forward uh, sort of a five-step uh, process to think about uh, when you're thinking about uh, starting an entrepreneurial venture. Actually, give us a sense of what those five steps are, if you could, and, and what you've got to do to achieve, uh, uh, achieve success in each one of them. Yeah, I think the first thing is to figure out what is your business plan, but don't be married to it. You need to be agile and you need to recognize that the marketplace may respond in a way that you didn't anticipate to your products or services. So the first thing is there's going to be iteration after iteration after iteration, and you need to be malleable and you need to be adaptable. So that's the number one thing. And what you want to think about is structuring your business all along the way and structuring it with the anticipation that in five years or 10 years, you are going to be super successful. You're going to have investors. You're end, going to end up having the opportunity to sell it out and have an exit plan, for example. It's a lot easier to set up your business at this stage with that possibly in mind. So the first thing is that you're going to want to set up your own business and you want to figure out what's the vehicle from which to do that. Sole proprietorship, incorporation, a partnership. What is the foundation, the legal foundation of your business? Some people will say, we'll just start it off as a sole proprietor, but know that the sole proprietor is ostensibly just you acting out there. 
if you have personal assets, if you own a home, a car, you know, you have some kind of retirement fund, you could be exposing your own personal assets to risk because you are operating this business. So a lot of people will prefer to operate their business as under an incorporation, which is a separate legal entity from you yourself, even if you're, it's an owner operator type business. So it's the assets of the business, not your own personal assets, that are going to be subject to risk. So number one is what is the legal foundation? Okay, number so let's 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 chat about that for a second. So um, you're saying you can insulate yourself from the, the the business risks to a certain extent from a legal standpoint by setting up uh, a corporation, um, and that corporation would take the risk. What if the bank or someone else comes along and asks you to uh, put on a personal guarantee? I mean that's something that when you're dealing with your clients, that's not going to be the situation. But if you are trying to get funding from the bank or you're trying to get a credit card, it is quite possible that they will ask for the personal guarantee. You can try and negotiate against that. It kind of depends on what your negotiating power is. For example, I'm sure that if Elon Musk has a different side business that he's starting, it might be a little bit of a different negotiating power to Joe Schmo down the road. So everything is a point of negotiation, which actually brings me to my second point is that it literally takes a village to not only raise a baby, but to raise your business baby as well. And so you want to make sure that all of your, your relationships, your business relationships are protected and covered and codified through a written written, and I would put that in big capital letters, a written contract, a written agreement. So the benefit of that is that you know exactly what are the terms and obligations and responsibilities of each partner and what are they bringing to the table. But in the event that something weird happens, someone doesn't perform, someone doesn't pay, someone's acting a little shady, you don't like dealing with them anymore, things go weird, which is clearly what 2020 is teaching us, that you have some kind of contractual relationship that you can go to. So it anchors and codifies a relationship. And if it's written by a lawyer and a good lawyer, they will take into account all of the different issues that might come into play that would make a good business relationship, not a good business relationship. And how do you manage the parting of those two people? So this is going to be applicable for literally everyone your partners, your investors, your shareholders, your independent contractors, your manufacturers, your suppliers, your employees. As long as you are dealing with someone that is other than yourself, it is best practice to get a written contract. You know, it's a, it's a surprise to me. So I teach a class uh, um, at the DeGroote School of Business in the uh, Executive MBA and Corporate Finance, uh, one of their final classes in that whole section. And uh, they know lots about finance, but they don't know much about, uh, they're not taught about exactly what you're talking about. And, and clearly I take it from a financial standpoint, but we talk about some of the different provisions that you've got to have in a shareholders agreement. Um, and we talk about, it's sort of like a prenup uh, for business, uh, like you'd have for a marriage and things like uh, drag along rights, tag along rights, um, uh, shotgun provisions, cash call provisions, minority rate provisions, majority rate provisions, all those kinds of vetoes, et cetera. And uh, all those things that, you know, when you think about 50% or more of marriages fail, businesses failure rates, uh, as far as relationships are concerned in businesses and shareholder agreements, got to be even more than that. Yeah. And so you really do need that prenup agreement. You in do. And the thing is, is that it's so much easier and cheaper to figure out those issues when A, everyone's on the same wavelength, there's no one has any grievances yet. No, there's no real money at play. It's so much easier to figure things out in an equitable way in the beginning when there's nothing to fight about than it is when, well, Joe didn't bring the money or she doesn't perform or she had a kid or he travels too much or he said he'd had these connections and he didn't. It's a lot easier to figure that all out in the beginning days than it is trying to deal with it when things are going awry. And, and uh, I'm not sure about you, but I've found uh, numerous different people that come to me for some advice where one person's putting in the money and the other person's putting in the sweat equity. And uh, you know, that's a good marriage of different skill sets and different uh, resources, but leads to a lot of problems because different people will value the money or the sweat equity in a very different way. Right. 
Right. And so that's something that you address and there should be performance milestones, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that's come up big time in 2020, obviously, is force majeure provisions. And that's something that we've written into your contract. So what happens when you have a manufacturer, you're getting products from China, for example, and they can't perform. And now you're supposed to be the person that's selling wholesale to this retailer. And now you don't have the funds coming in. How do we deal with all of this force majeure? Because it's outside of our control of non-performance of the contract. So the contracts truly, truly are there to help you and be a tool for your business. So those are so two of the main just things. Just in case people don't understand force majeure, can you define it for us? Absolutely. So a force majeure is basically a provision, and it's normally in the last couple of pages of the contract, where it looks at the reasons why there could be non-performance of whatever it is that was supposed to be performed and excuses it. And it's not a reason why you would terminate or penalize the non-performing party. So in this situation, let's say that there was a flood and it was outside of the control of the company that was supplying the good. Well, now in this situation with a global pandemic, if there's a government shutdown, no one's going to the factory, they cannot manufacture the goods to provide the goods by the certain deadline that they're supposed to be shipped at for example. So if the force majeure was there and also included global pandemics as one of those acts of God, then it would not be possible to sue for non-performance. So we've got business plan, corporate entity, um, drafting contracts. Yeah. What's next? Intellectual property intellectual property. So the United Nations has an agency that only deals with intellectual property laws. It's called WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Office. They have estimated, estimated that between 45 to 75 percent of the wealth of companies comes from its intellectual property rights. Some will be the sexy kind patents, but others will be the intangible kinds, the branding, the je ne sais quoi factor. But these are actually very much commodified. For example, if you look at sneakers, the value of a sneaker goes up exponentially if you have a small little swoosh on it, for example. That ability to manipulate consumer behavior is a significant corporate asset because it has value to it. So making sure that you are protecting your intellectual property, doesn't matter if you're a big company or a small company, is going to be integral. It's actually interesting. In 2017, I think, 2018, I don't know, 2020 feels like it's been five years long. But Minister Baines, Navdeep Baines, who uh, deals with Industry Canada for, uh, for the federal government, he put out a white paper that basically said that small to medium-sized businesses in Canada only about 10% of them have an intellectual property strategy and are investing in protecting their intellectual property to their detriment. And interestingly enough, women-owned businesses are amongst the worst businesses that actually protect their intellectual property. So when you're thinking about your business and its ability to grow and to become profitable and to become a target for investors or a takeover, your intellectual property is a significant corporate asset and this has significant corporate value that will be considered in, is this a valuable company or not? Why, so why, do you think, why do you think Canadians and particularly Canadian female entrepreneurs um, are so non-attentive to intellectual property issues? Perhaps knowledge, I don't know. I'm not sure and I can't really speak to that. The, the white paper itself talked about the statistics and what the statistics demonstrated, it did not go into the rationale of why the statistics were there. Okay, so you corrected me and said you don't do patents. Uh, can you explain to us the difference between patents, trademarks, and copyright though? Yeah, so there's really five pillars of intellectual property rights. Patents is the sexiest and probably the most expensive, but also the most coveted type of intellectual property. So that's, lo you're looking at, uh, the exclusive rights over the right to manufacture, something that is novel, inventive, non-obvious. Uh, it goes a lot with technology. Uh, it goes with um, uh, widgets. It's very much of a widget type of thing. So uh, we can even take 
an example would be the bra. Back in the 1800s, there was no such thing as a bra. That was actually a patent, which meant that that company had the monopoly over 20 years to be able to manufacture that product. So the intellectual property regime is there to provide government incentive for businesses to create, to evolve, to better our society. So patents is probably the primary one that a lot of people talk about. And then patents last for typically how long? 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. And uh, do, uh, do, would you recommend people, and I know you don't practice in this area, but um, you know, they're, are they going to uh, go for a patent in Canada, the United States, around the world, or just one? I mean, a lot of, I, I don't personally do patents. I've worked at a lot of intellectual property firms, so I've been around a lot of patents, and I can certainly refer people to patent lawyers. I think generally the, the, the strategy tends to be that Canadian companies will uh, file a provisional patent in the U.S., just to get their foot in the door and then evolve from that. But like I said, this is not my practice area. So I probably shouldn't be talking so much in depth about strategies. Okay. So Uh, so what's next? uh, Trademark protection. That's going to be applicable to every business that has a brand and every business has a brand. So that is basically the Pied Piper of manipulating consumer behavior. So why you go to this company over that company. It's interesting because through the trademarks, there's an unspoken dialogue between the consumer and the company through that jingle, through that swoosh, through that slogan, dude, you're getting a Dell, or because you're worth it, or 967-1111, you're going to get a pizza from Pizza Pizza. So it's interesting because the trademark manipulates consumer behavior to choose Pizza Pizza over Pizza Hut because it's ingrained into so- our so is a trademark just the name or is it the the slogan and tagline as well it can be anything so when you go this is a fascinating thing i love trademarks law so the interesting thing is uh let's see you remember when we used to go to the movies the cinema back in the day yep 10 months ago so you go to the cinema and all of a sudden you'd hear lions roar you knew that that movie was produced by mgf by metro and metro goldwyn meyer they were able to trademark the sound of that roaring lion. So uh, you see a woman walking down the street and her shoes have red bottom soles. You know that she bought Christian Louboutin soles. That's a trademark as well. So sound marks, color marks, uh, texture, smell, sound. So, I, I, so hold on, you're kidding. So no one else can put red on the bottom sole of their shoe? Well, that's a whole other segment that we can get into. And so actually a couple of years ago, Yves Saint Laurent and Christian Louboutin had a huge fight over the proprietary rights of red bottom soles. Super interesting. (laughs) Okay, fine. Okay, so we've got patents, we've got trademarks. What's next, copyright? Copyright, so that's very wide in scope. It's got a lower threshold, but this is anything that is creative. So music, literary work, uh, 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 artistic, um, visual, it's wider in scope. And for your basic, you know, obviously musicians and actors and screenwriters and video games industry, it's going to be integral for them. But even for your standard website development, your brochures, if you're have a tech pack that you're sending out to manufacturers. So copyright is a very useful tool as well. We've also got industrial design, which is kind of a sleeping giant in Canada. It's basically a utilitarian article that is highly aesthetic. So a spoon that has an oversized ladle, for example. People don't use it as much. But then another really interesting, so those are statutory types of intellectual property, but you can't forget about trade secrets. So these are contractually held pinky swear secrets. So if you have a very um, unique recipe that you don't want to put out there and have everyone uh, copy, that would be something that you ensure is protected under contractual obligation. Okay. So that's intellectual property. You've got two more. What are the last two? E-commerce internet and technology law, social media law. You can't have a business anymore without having um, 
an online presence. E-commerce is obviously like a game changer. Um, and then having social media law, uh, complying with social media as well. So that takes into account all sorts of marketing and advertising practices. Um, it kind of overlaps with uh, intellectual property in a way. You've got packaging and labeling acts or legislation. So your made in Canada, your product of Canada, is it organic? These are all statutorily uh, uh, governed as well. So the sort of bigger marketing and advertising laws, your internet and technology, your e-commerce, that's very much a big part of, of, um, of a company strategy as well. And then your last one has got something about developing an app. Well, so for some, it's going to be important. For others, it may be that they're relying on a third party app. So internet and technology is always going to be a part of everyone's business now. I don't think that there's going to be any business that won't have that. And probably there shouldn't have been any businesses that didn't have some kind of internet technology aspect to them. And so that's going to be applicable if you are, in fact, creating your own e-commerce or if you're creating your own uh, tech company or if you're an influencer that now wants to create their own social media app to create their own marketplace. So just to review, number one is get a business plan. Number two is select the correct corporate structure, legal entity. Number three is uh, draft contracts uh, and negotiate them. Four is understand uh, intellectual property laws. Five is create a uh, social media uh, campaign. And six is navigating the laws uh, in regards to apps. That's a good review of the legal guide for entrepreneurs. Ashley Frost, thank you uh, so much. Uh, if people want to access uh, your services, how do they do that? So you would go to the internet, uh, froze law, F-R-O-E-S-E law.com. Well, thank you, Ashley Froze, again, for uh, talking us through some suggestions for entrepreneurs and for people when uh, they want to launch their businesses, what they got to think of. Thanks very much for joining us tonight on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.